U.S. Brig Niagara. He and his wife all in the summertime on this uh, Brig and they go out. So I talked to him today and he's looking forward to coming. I'm going to introduce Glenn. <laughs> Glenn Flickinger, owner and president of the Alternative Board Pittsburgh, provides business coaching and peer advisory board facilitation to private companies in Allegheny, Westmoreland, and Washington counties. <coughs> Glenn is also founder and president of Flickinger and Associates LLC, an independent consulting firm specializing in merger and acquisitions, placement of growth capital, and management buyouts for private and family-owned companies. Glenn is a senior executive with 40 years experience as a business owner, manager, and consultant in a wide range of settings. As a TAB facilitator slash coach, Glenn works with growth-oriented business owners to increase the value of their business by developing strategies to increase sales and productivity and putting in place the appropriate capital structure to achieve strategic plans. His experience is uniquely suited as a business coach as he has been a commercial banker, investment banker, consultant, business owner, and investor in private companies. He has helped many company owners to develop strategic plans and execute strategies to achieve their objectives. Glenn is the past chairman of the advisory board of the Center for Latin American Studies the University of Pittsburgh, a former trustee of the Watson Institute, and a former member of the Allegheny County Finance and Development Commission. He served for five years on the board of advisors of RICO, RICO. RICO Manufacturing Company in New York, Pennsylvania. Uh, Glenn lives with his wife in Upper St. Clair and his three adult children. He's a graduate of Washington Jefferson College where he has taught as an adjunct professor of business. He has an MBA from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Glenn has been lecturing on World War I and World War II at the Upper St. Clair and Mount Lebanon Libraries the past year plus. Let's give him a big welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, You're welcome. I didn't I know that you were yeah. going to read all of that. I hope it didn't bore you to tears. <laughs> Uh, oh, there's more. I didn't read no, Well, good. good. <laughs> that was uh, more than enough. Uh, I'd rather not use the speaker. Is that the microphone? Is, is that okay? Can everybody hear me okay? I'll try to uh, speak as loud as I can. So uh, thanks very much. And thank to John, who I think heard this lecture a year or so ago at St. Clair Library, uh, for inviting me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I love doing this because it's my hobby. All those other things just was a way of trying to survive and make money and send my kids to school. Uh, this is what I love. Um, I, I should have been a history professor. I, I'm not. Uh, so uh, please understand, I'm not a history professor. <laughs> I've taught a lot of business classes uh, to undergrad and graduate, but I've not taught history to anybody but groups like yours. Um, uh, maybe a little background on why is uh, I almost brought my mom tonight. She lives over in Scott Township. Uh, and she's one of the reasons I started off in history in that She's a Pearl Harbor survivor, and uh, she's 97 years old, still lives on her own up in Scott, still drives, and uh, is healthy as a horse. I think she actually takes uh, fewer prescription medicines than I do. Uh, but she was at, uh, she's Hawaiian by birth, and um, she was at uh, Pearl Harbor. Not on the day of the attack, she was home because it was a Sunday, and uh, uh, she worked at the hospital there as a nurse's aide, assistant, you know. And uh, uh, she went down the next day or two afterwards and spent a week uh, before she went home again uh, cleaning up and burying bodies and all the terrible things that you can imagine um, she went through. Um, and then I had four uncles who were in World War II. My father was the kid on the farm and he was left behind because he was just a little too young. Another year and he'd have probably been there too. And I, so I grew up hearing about, you know, stories from my four uncles about World War II, uh, two in the Pacific and two in Europe, and they all came home. So uh, they, we were very blessed and fortunate. But just sort of through all that, I, I started reading when I was a kid on military history in general. Started with the Revolutionary War, went to the Civil War, and after that I started World War II, and then I realized, 
you can't understand World War II if you don't understand World War I. So, uh, you know, and, you know, I, ha I have a library at home uh, with about a thousand books like this. <laughs> oh. um, all of which I've read, all of which I've marked up, and I consult these things, uh, you know, when I give lectures. Uh, so I'm really just reflecting all these famous, famous historians who I've read. And if you want to read a book on the origins of World War II, which is tonight's subject, this is the book for you, right? It's, it's, it's not that long. Uh, it just looks big. Uh, Fateful Choices by uh, a famous, famous British historian named Ian Kershaw. K-E-R-S-H-A-W. Ten Decisions That Changed the World, 40 to 41. And uh, this man is just a brilliant historian. And anything he writes, and he writes a lot, um, uh, you should read. So um, that's, uh, that's one recommendation. There's many, many others. So how, how, first, any uh, World War II veterans in the audience? No, military veterans? Put your hand up. No? Okay. Well, thank you for your service. Uh, I ask that because at all of the St. Clair and Mount Lebanon lectures, I get a couple of World War II veterans that are that are there. John, you might remember them. They're obviously in their 90s. They're some of them uh, as old as my mom. And like my mom, they they sort of bounce up and spring around like they're you know uh, uh, 40 years old again, <laughs> which I'm just marvel at. Uh, we've met a P-51 pilot. Uh, B-29 Navigator, uh, and I can't remember the others, but um, it's fascinating to see them still around. And if you go to the, uh, I may murder the name of this, the Veteran Breakfast Club? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I've been to many of them this past year. I've not had the time to go, and, you know, it's another great place to meet World War II veterans, as well as Vietnam and Korean and so forth. So it's fascinating, I think, to, for me, uh, given my hobby to be in front of them and you know hear about their experiences. So how did this happen, World War II? Where in the world, how in the world, did we get into World War II, not we as the United States, but the world, and lose 60 plus million people in the course of six years? All right? It's, it's unbelievable that that many people died. And if 60 million um, died in World War II, another 20 million had died in World War I. Um, I excuse yes? me, I have a question about sure. when you said how many died. Are you also considering the British who were bombed? And, you know, or uh, or is it just in our country? No, no, oh, no, no. Okay. World World, we had okay. very, very okay. few deaths. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so 60 million is combatants and non-combatants, okay. okay? Actually, it was probably only, don't take this as the gospel, probably only 17, 18 million combatants who died. In World War II, there were 40 plus million civilians who died, okay? World War I, the numbers are about 20 million, right? Uh, given the increase in the population of the world since then, if that were to happen again today, we're talking about what, 150 million people dying. Anybody know Rick Atkinson, the famous uh, uh, historian and writer? Anybody read any of his books at dawn, or uh, An Army at Dawn? He's written a trilogy of, of World War II. Uh, another fantastic author, right? He makes history as you read it almost like you're reading a novel instead of uh, you know a textbook. Uh, and it's not a textbook, but Rick Atkinson has this famous, famous example, which I'll steal from him and give you as long as it, well, I guess it is on tape, so maybe I'll get in trouble. Um, during the six years, of, as he defined it, of World War II, a person died, on average, every three seconds. So he's, he does that by saying one, two, three, one, two, three. You know, you just can't imagine it when you put numbers around it, okay? So how did this happen? What, you know, what were the origins of all this, okay? Um, so let, let's start with understanding who the players were, all right? Who were the starting, what was the starting lineup in 1939, okay? So on the Allied side, we had 
let's just start with good old USA. How many people in the, in the US at that time? Someone take a guess. 131 billion. There we go. <laughs> I can depend on John. President? Roosevelt. Roosevelt. FDR. Roosevelt. FDR. 1939, he was in his second term in office, just ending it, and about to run for an unprecedented third term. Mm -hmm. Right? A victim of polio could not walk one step without his braces. Right, and as the war went on, began to lose his health, health in total, and became another casualty of the war. Okay, so what was the economic situation of, of uh, the USA in 1939? Not too great. Depression. 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 Yeah. Right. Depression started in '29 with the stock market crash. Got worse and worse in the early '30s had its ups and downs, at one point had 25% or more unemployment, right? Hard to believe one in four people that, that wanted to work could not work, all right? The economy, you know, uh, you know, at one point fell by, I think, as much as 20 odd percent in terms of gross national product, right? I'm sure, like, like me, many of you have uh, fathers and mothers who lived through the Great Depression, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm, sure. Yeah. Right, and, and there's a certain mentality that those people had, you know, about savings, about yeah. uh, risk. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to. I have a my mother-in-law, God bless her. Um, she, she at Christmas time, she would never want you, kids to rip off the, uh, the wrapping paper off of the gifts. Yeah. She wanted to take it <laughs> out <laughs> carefully and fold it again for next year. <laughs> Which, oh, geez, I don't know. Where'd you get that from? And then one day I realized that's a depression sort of attitude, you know. So uh, the country was on its heels. By 1939, the, the, the U.S. was uh, improving in its economic uh, situation quite a bit, right? Quite a bit. It wasn't in the depths of the recessions that we had in the mid-30s. People were going back to work, manufacturing was picking up. Why? For the country, for, for the war. For the war. Yeah. Not the war that the U.S. was involved in at that point, but the war in Europe, and to some extent in Asia, that was, that was heating up. So one could argue, pretty, as, an, as an economist, one could argue pretty convincingly, the only thing that got us out of depression was World War II, all right? Which is not a very... So, give me another name. Who else were, were, were our allies during World War II? Churchill. Churchill, Churchill. Churchill as in UK, all right? Churchill, was he the prime minister in 1939? No. 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 Became prime minister in? 1940, right? When, uh, oh geez, the name is not, uh, who was the prime minister before Churchill? Chamberlain, Chamberlain that's right. The great appeaser uh, finally fell, okay? Churchill becomes uh, the prime minister. And what was the situation in the UK? And it's really, when you say the UK, we really ought to think empire, right? This was really the height of the British Empire in the 20s and 30s in terms of geography. The sun never set, literally, on the British Empire, right? right? A quarter of the world population uh, under the British Empire. So what was happening in the, U in the British Empire at this time, especially the UK? They were trying to be free. They were rebelling. Well, I'm thinking just before the war. So, how many people did, how many men died, mostly men, uh -huh. died for the uh, British Empire during World War I? About a million. About a million. It's actually about 900, just under 900,000 Englishmen, and then 100,000 or so non Englishmen, the, the uh, Indians and uh, South Africans and the other parts of the empire, right? So, you know, anybody, anybody have found of Downton Abbey, right? Yes. Yeah. So I've watched it like 10 times, right? So, and you know, the favorite is by, is the second season when they cover World War 
mm -hmm. one, right? Mm -hmm. And then the seasons afterwards, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple of lines in there where the daughters who are all trying to find somebody to marry say, I, I don't have anybody to even date with. All the men I danced with, you know, before the war are gone, which was literally true. Right. Yeah. Literally true. I, I can't remember which of the famous uh, British schools. Uh, they looked at their class of 1916, and there were, you know, 150 graduates, and there was only a dozen or so left alive by the end of the war. So it was devastating. Devastating, right? The Depression had hit the UK just as hard, maybe not quite as hard as in the US. Okay? So it was a bit of a mess. Give me another ally. Stalin. Stalin, as in the Soviet, the Soviet Union. With Stalin as the dictator. Nice guy, huh? Uh -huh. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Right? He can make he can make Hitler look like a boy scout. That's right. He right. could. I mean, yeah, he was terrible. Yeah, he was absolutely terrible. How did they become our allies? <clears throat> Why would we ally because with Because of Hitler? <laughs> right? Churchill basically, you know, hated Stalin. The US certainly didn't like communism. But we had no choice because, and I'll go through that in a little bit, as to how they that had happened. The manpower. They had the manpower, right? 85% of all German military deaths occurred in the Soviet Union, right? That front, that war, was five times as big as the war the U.S. and the U.K. fought That's in right. Europe right. on the Western Front, okay? okay? And well, how was the Soviet Union doing? economically all right not so good all right still was very much a country of peasants of farmers of small villages just a few large industrial centers moscow uh kiev in the ukraine ukraine a few others right and by the way St stalin in his great wisdom once in a while would just go out and purge you know, a few million people here or there, certainly purged his officer corps in the army, all right? So the army was very, very weak, okay? So, another ally. France at that time. France. At that time. Oh, De Gaulle. France? No, not De Gaulle. That wasn't De Gaulle. No, no that was later. Mm -hmm. That was later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Actually, I'll look at my notes. That's why I got notes. <laughs> who was the Who was the Prime Minister of France at this time? Um, well, here's the point I make. I don't remember because there were about a dozen between the end of World War One and the beginning of World War Two. Wow. Right? They changed prime ministers as often as we change socks. Mm -hmm. Right? And and so it was a it, the political. Uh, system in France was debilitated, right? Couldn't make decisions, didn't know which way to go. The oppression had hurt it. How many men did France lose in World War II? No, oh, one, I'm sorry, World War I. Okay. Don't quote me on this, but a million five, all right? More than the British, by far. Might even be closer to two million, as I recall, all right? The place was just devastated. Europe was devastated, okay? Uh, one more ally, we could go deeper, but one more main one. Norway or Sweden? Let's go to the other side of the world. Australia. Oh. Australia was one. China. China. Right? Who was running China at this point? Oh, Chiang Kai-shek Kai on the nationalist side, yeah. but since the early 30s, wow. a man yeah. named Mao Zedong had, had uh, started the Communist Party within China, and there was actually a civil war going on all throughout the 30s in China, right? China had been one of the, you know, us in the West, and I'm certainly not a Chinese history guy by any stretch, but you know we don't give enough credit to China over the history of the world <laughs> as to what they did, what they accomplished, right? We only remember sort of it for the American history, uh, the period of American history, the last 250 years, and the last hundred and some years up until the last couple decades 
China was just a mess, right? Uh, the last emperor uh, of China was in the 18, died or left in the 1870s, maybe 1860s, and every country in the world rushed in to get a peace. The Germans got a peace, the French got a peace, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the Brits did. We picked apart China with colonies and so forth because of the unrest within the country. Okay. So that's kind of the lineup for uh, the Allies. So what about the other side? What about the, what came to be known as the Axis powers? Obviously the first one is Germany. Germany, Japan, right. Italy. So there's that man, Hitler, in Germany, 1939. He's been in power since 33. Right, came to came to power about the exact same time FDR was uh, taking the presidency in '33, in March of '33. Uh, right, at this point he has consolidated his power. The Nazi Party is uh, uh, fundamentally in charge of everything, down to local villages and uh, 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 every little corner was uh, run by the Nazi Party. And the British, I'm sorry, the uh, German <coughs> industrialists were doing what? Krupp, making, Bayer. They were making mm -hmm. more supplies. They were making money hand over fist mm -hmm. under Hitler, right? And these guys were happy to have them because, you know, went from a severe depression. 1933, when Hitler came to power, he really came to power over the course of two or three years, 31 to 33. Um, what was happening in Germany to the, what was called then the Weimar Republic. Depression. I mean, we, we tend to think, you know, the depression was a U.S. sort of thing. It was a worldwide depression. And Germany was probably hit harder, faster, and deeper than, than any other country at that time. Why? And what followed called the Versailles Treaty. Right, All right. They actually recovered quite well in the in the late twenties or mid twenties and into the late twenties, mostly financed by Wall Street, mostly financed by J.P. Morgan and fill in the blank other names on Wall Street by with loans. So we had this deep interconnection with them. So would Hitler have come to power had there not been a depression in Germany? Maybe. Who knows? Many he, brought, he brought the nationalism back, the love of the country back. Right. Well, that's what they rallied around. That's right. That's right. They rallied around him as a nationalist, <coughs> obviously a rather extreme nationalist to the point to be a fascist, I think. Um, and uh, uh, there's many historians, including this one and others, who uh, noted historians who think had there not been a depression in Germany, Hitler would not have come to power. It's something you can debate for fun over a couple of beers or glasses of wine all night long, right? No one knows, obviously, but uh, he had lost, not gained enough seats in Parliament in their, uh, the Bundestag uh, for several years, and it was only with the Depression that his and his nationalism, his extreme vetting of the Versailles Treaty and so forth, that he finally convinced. He never got a majority, but he got enough. To, uh, to permit him to become uh, chancellor. And even then, even then, it was Hindenburg, who was the president of Germany, in effect, who was the World War I hero, who finally bent to the, uh, uh, Hitler's uh, efforts to become prime minister, uh, or to become uh, chancellor of Germany. All right. So Germany, by 1939, its, its economy had recovered nicely because they're, they're busy building tanks and planes and weapons and so forth. Virtually no unemployment in the country at this time. And the army had expanded from 100,000 in 1933 to several million by 1939. Okay. So who else is on the uh, Axis side? Austria. Really? Mussolini. Mr. Mussolini. Mussolini. I'll just put Mussolini. I'll just put Musso. All right. <laughs> Musso, the original fascist, was really a mentor to Hitler. 
When did Mussolini come to power? 1923, 24. Very good. Very good. I'm going to that's, give you an extra cookie for that. That's, that's because my German relative ah. said their trouble started in 1923. So it came to power in, in 22, 23. Uh, uh, again, uh, depression in Italy, post-World War I, it was a mess. Uh, change of governments all the time. Okay, but, but it did have a monarchy system. So he came to power as sort of prime minister. I get money to be sure what they called him under a king, right? Mm -hmm. King Leopold, I believe it was. And uh, it was, to some extent, still sort of subject to, you know, the aristocracy's uh, desires, okay? Tried to build the Italian army, you know, let's face it, Italians make love a lot better than they make war. <laughs> so, wine, too. And wine, yeah. So, although they were never a huge factor in the war, Obviously, we lost a lot of men in Sicily and Italy invading them. Uh, uh, in the early 30s, you know, he was Hitler's buddy, and he was almost a protege. Okay. <laughs> and then the last, the other big, big one, of course, is Japan. And who was running Japan? Tokyo. Japan. So the emperor was Hirohito. Okay. Um, and, the, and then from there, it kind of goes back to being like France, a different uh, prime minister every six or nine months. And what had gone on, where, where was uh, Japan in World War I? Which side were, were they on? The Axis. No, no. Not allies. 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 And in fact, at the end of the war, they were rewarded with a bunch of islands in the Pacific, <laughs> which we then had to go take back from them uh, during World War II, right? So Hirohito came to power in uh, 21, I'm sorry, 20, 26, but he was 21 years old, right? Took over from his grandfather, who had died a year or so earlier. Skipped his father, his father had all sorts of health problems, mental problems, right? Hirohito comes to power. And what's going on in Japan at this time? Political. Chaos. Chaos. The uh, Japanese army and the Japanese navy was gaining power. And as the 20s and 30s wore on, there was coup after coup. Two or three of the prime ministers were assassinated. Many cabinet members were assassinated at different times. It was kind of a war between the army, the navy, whatever civilian power there still was left, which there wasn't much left, with Hirohito sort of looking down at it. There's a book by, a, I think it's a Robert Bix, B-I-X, called Hirohito, it's wrote about 10 years ago. That is another you know, big, thick one that is just an excellent, excellent uh, view of Hirohito. Was Hirohito ever a dictator? Ever a what? Dictator. Oh, Not really. Not really. He was sort of overlooked a pretty bad system and turned his, turned his face the other way, right? So there were various, various prime ministers of Japan. The two famous ones, one I'm sure you, won't, you might not recognize, is a man named Kanoya. He was prime minister off and on two or three times. He was the prime minister during the run-up to uh, World War II. Uh, by the Japanese, and the military kept trying to take over, trying to take over, which they, they virtually ran the country. And in 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor, that's when Tojo became prime minister. So you had a military man as prime minister. And that's who most people associate with, you know, who's the dictator of Japan, Tojo. And it's very complicated. I mean, you know, it's a sort of a puzzle wrapped up, what's Churchill say, in an enigma wrapped up in, you know, it, it's very difficult to understand Japanese politics, right, during this time. Even today, it's, kind of, it's not so easy, right? So Tojo really runs the war, and Hirohito sort of sits there and, you know, nods his head every once in a while uh, and survives the war, right, as emperor, which was surprising at the end of the war, okay? So what's the, uh, what's the common theme here among all these countries? What's, what's the common theme, theme among, in the world? 
question? Well, yes. I think for one thing, they were jealous of the United States and Great Britain because they weren't doing as well financially and they didn't have places where they could, um, you know, get, uh, have oil and things like that that they wanted and needed for their production of things, you know. Part of it, one, one of the reasons we went to war with Japan was over oil and mm -hmm. steel mm -hmm. and natural resources in general. So what, what, what other sort of major point here is going on among all these countries during the 1920s and 30s? For economic. Yeah. yeah. Depression, economic chaos among every na nation that we mentioned up there, and political chaos, right? FDR came to pre in the presidency in 32, well, elected in 32, came to office in 33, and you know, people forget there was a lot of uh, socialist factors. There were all sorts of people thinking that the U.S. capitalist system had failed, and we needed something different. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and really, it was FDR that kind of held it together with the New Deal and all the other things that he, you know, he did right, right or wrong, in, in, your, in anybody's view, but. Um, so even in the U.S., it was political chaos, chaos as well, and certainly more so in just about all these countries. The U.K. politically was stable, but none of these other allied countries were, and Germany, Italy, Japan were clearly not. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the lineup. Okay. So, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, something oh, else I can towel. use? Maybe a paper towel? A wet paper towel. A wet paper towel? Yes. I, I need it for the second half of the lecture. <laughs> okay, sorry for the interruption there, and hopefully we can clean this up afterwards, but I think I can make it work as it is. So, I've got a real simple question for you, and John can't answer this because he's heard it before, and Marianne might have before as well. Uh, so when did World War II start? Okay. When September did World War II start? So we're going to do or try to do. Poland and We're going to try to do a little timeline. I think it's hard in thirty-nine. So the top is Asia. The bottom is Europe. In the middle is the U.S. Okay, sorry for that. So, I'll give you some clues. In Asia, the earliest possible date would be 1854. In Europe, the earliest possible date, at least in my opinion, would be 19, or 1870. That's 18. <laughs> I can't hear him. Okay. So, when did, well, give me some thoughts. When did World War II start? I heard. We went to Poland in 1939, September. So, clearly. When the Archduke was clearly, assassinated. 9 1 39. Don't you remember that? When what happens? No, That's when Pol Pol uh, Germany, Germany invades Poland. Poland. Yeah. Germany yeah, invades that, Poland. The that beginning point. of everything. All right. I think. What happened up before that? I was four years old when Pearl Harbor happened. That's down here I was too young to yeah. remember what happened before that. 9 1 39, Germany invades Poland. Mm -hmm. What was going on in Europe before that that led up to that? Hitler came to power in 33. Built the German army. Mm -hmm. What did he do between 33 and 39? He was fighting for Aztec, Lorraine. Took the Rhineland in 35. Sutherland. Rhineland was occupied by, uh, uh, well, it was a demilitarized zone at that point. But after World War I, it was occupied by French, U.S., and British troops for a while. They were withdrawn. It was agreed to be demilitarized. That was his first move. He, he, over, he takes the Rhineland back. That's the part between the Rhine River and then the interior of, of Germany, okay? What else was going on in that 1930s time frame? 
Stalin. Austria. Austria, 1938. Oh, yeah. Austria. Yeah. The annexes, Austria. All right. So he's slowly taking power, right? There was the famous yeah. Munich conference where the British, French give him uh, Czechoslovakia in 1938. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there was, he took Czechoslovakia just took what was called the Sudetenland, which were the borders of Czechoslovakia with Germany, where there was a majority German population, and said, that's all I want, I'm done. And then three or four months later, he marches in and takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay? So what happens when, uh, when uh, he invades Poland? England declares war on Germany. Who else invaded Poland at the same time? Russia. Russia. The Soviet Union, mm -hmm. right? Through the treaty that they had negotiated just the month before, uh, Hitler comes in, takes two thirds of Poland, and the Russians come from the other direction after a couple of weeks and take the other third of Poland, right? Poland goes back to what it had always been, or many times had been, which wasn't, it wasn't a nation. It was a place where Poles lived, but oftentimes there was no Poland. Okay, it was always split between Prussia, the earlier ancestor of Germany, and the Soviet Union, or Russia, and even the Swedes at one time <laughs> had parts of Poland, All right? Under, well, whatever. So, 33, any other dates as to when, why did I write 1870 here? What happened in 1870? Germany invaded France. Right, right. So, what was, it really wasn't Germany that invaded France. Who invaded France? Prussia. Right. It's called the Prussian, the, I'm sorry, the Franco-Prussian uh, Franco War, right? Mm -hmm. Which, and who was running Prussia at that time? A man named Bismarck, who was the chancellor. Never elected, served under uh, the king, King the Hohenzoller uh, family, Hohenzollern family. Right, who had run Prussia for four or five hundred years. Right, how many German countries? How many German-speaking countries and nation states and city states? I'm sorry, were there in 1860s? Dozens. Dozens. Thirty-six, thirty-seven. Right, the big ones were Prussia, Austria, and to some extent Bavaria was big, but the powerhouse was Prussia. Right? When Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, who showed up at the last minute to make sure that the battle was won by uh, the British? The Prussians. The Prussians, right? So the Prussians had been in Central Europe, the really strong entity, along with the Habsburgs, the family, the family name Habsburgs, who ran Austria, Austria-Hungary, and large swaths of Central America, or Central uh, uh, Europe at that time, okay? So along comes uh, Bismarck. Bismarck wants to unify uh, the German-speaking countries. And there's three wars which he then propagates, okay? First was a war up uh, in the northwest where he takes parts of what were Denmark and makes them parts of, parts of Germany. I think it's called the Holzweg Schweitzstein. You, you would pronounce it better than I could. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. <laughs> it wasn't a big territorial grab, but it started in things. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and in 1869 fights Austria, which was considered the military powerhouse at the time, and he beats them easily Okay, in 1869. Uh, uh, right? So he doesn't take over Austria, but it quiets Austria. It goes off into the corner and sulks. And then recognizing that he needed to do more to unify all the German city-states. 1871. 1871, 1870, and then in leaking into 71, he unifies the German, uh, the Prussian army with the other German city-states, and they invade France. Uh, take the king, uh, King Napoleon III, uh, prisoner, and surround Paris in 1871 for the better part of a year, and they take Paris. Okay. And that's when the German Empire is declared. Uh, they take a corner of France called the Alsace-Lorraine, which had gone back and forth forever and a day, yeah. and they go back. 
All right. So that's war number one. <clears throat> Let's call it. What was war number two between Germany and France? World War I. World War I. All right, 1914. Okay. 14 to 18. Which really was the second war between Germany and France. Yes, Britain gets pulled in because the Germans decide to invade France through uh, Belgium. And the, the British had basically set up Belgium as a protectorate to keep... Uh, uh, keep uh, powers away from the from the channel, and they invade. Uh, the French and uh, the French, of course, are are part of it. And for the first time, there's also a war on the Western Front against Russia. All right, so Germany is fighting a two-front war at that time. Okay, do the Germans take Paris this time? No. All right, they come close a couple of times during the war but they do not take Paris. Paris is uh, uh, bombarded. Uh, many citizens fled a couple of different times when they thought the Germans were gonna break through and take it, but they end up not, okay? And the horrors of World War I, as uh, shown on Downton Abbey, uh, you know, are there, right? So that's war number two, 1870, 1914 to 18, and then World War II. So, Nine, and on September 1st, 39, <clears throat> Hitler invades Poland, takes it in what? Six weeks, all right? And then what's he do next? Nothing, he sits there for about seven or eight months. Uh, eventually in the spring of 40, he turns around and takes Scandinavia, which he thought he had to take to protect his flank. He also wanted the, um, uh, the seaports along the coast of Norway for his submarines to get out. Okay, during World War II, that was a big problem, for, or World War I, yeah. that was a big problem for them, right? He also wanted certain minerals from Scandinavia that he couldn't get anywhere else, okay? Turns out to be a big mistake on his part later in the war, right? And then when does he invade France? May 10th, 1940. The day that Churchill became prime minister. Many people make the mistake and say that, well, Churchill became prime minister because of that. No, he had, he had actually uh, uh, ready to take over the day before. The king had to wait and you know, appoint him the new prime minister. And then they found out that Germany had invaded France, right? And the French buckle. All those problems, the army is considered the uh, best army in the world. Anybody see the Dunkirk movie? No, yeah. I'd like to, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's an interesting movie. It's very different. Uh, were you at the lecture I gave at the theater, John? No? So Scott and I put on a lecture on Dunkirk uh, before the movie for mostly it was the Mount Lebanon and some St. Clair people came. We had 50 people there. It was in that little room in the uh, Galleria there with the, uh, uh, what's the, uh, Panera Bread. So it was very interesting, but... I had to explain to everybody how it came to be, because in the movie they don't explain what happened, right? The Germans think they're gonna do the sort of, sort of same thing they did in World War I, except they end up coming through the Ardennes, the extremely wooded area, and they break through. And this time they break through with tanks, not just a few tanks, hundreds and hundreds of tanks, yeah. right? They break through. The French have committed all the reserves to try to break through up into the Netherlands. They come behind the uh, French and British forces and, and trap them at Dunkirk. They should have annihilated them. They should easily could have annihilated them and at that moment won World War II, at least the European War. Right? But Hitler and one of the famous generals named von Rundstadt issue a Holt order. And it's, it's one of the most debated items of World War II there is, as to why. And there's many, many different theories. I won't bore you with them now. But they stopped the tanks for three days just outside of Dunkirk, which allows the famous and uh, miracle of Dunkirk to occur, where the British evacuate 370 or 80,000 British and French soldiers. Right. All right. So that's war number three, World War II, in Europe. 
So this is really, there's a famous author, another historian named John Lukacs. Anybody ever read him? Uh, series of books about this. Uh, uh, one is called The European War, The Last European War. And that's really what happened here. Three wars inside of 70 years. There were people who were adults, maybe in their teens, 20-ish, born in 1850, who were still alive in 1940. Right? There weren't any veterans from 1870 still fighting in 1940, but there were adults. Right? Marshal Pétain was a kid way back here, so he wasn't involved in the military part of it, but he, his parents were, and he knew what had happened. So if you're the average Frenchman, and you see the Huns coming over the hill, you're like, how many, you know, how many times are these guys going to come? And this time, again, they take Paris. right? So two out of the three wars, they take Paris, and they, this time they occupy it for uh, nine, five years, four and a half years or so. Actually, almost exactly four years. So, All right. So, this was a European war. Okay. Then up here, with in Asia, Japan, let's call it. What happened in 1854? Why would I start there? 1854. Man named a U.S. Commodore named Perry does what? He. He floats into Tokyo Harbor, Tokyo Bay, and says, hey, <laughs> we're here. Uh, we're the Western world. Uh, Tokyo or Japan for hundreds of years have been isolated. Those great famous stories, one of those great uh, miniseries way back in the 70s and 80s. Remember that one? I can't remember. Shogun, Shogun. right? <laughs> uh, Richard Chamberlain, right? Remember him? Yeah. That was all true. You know, <laughs> they, they'd all, you know they, they had basically shut themselves out from the rest of the world. And in, in 1854, he opens it up. It doesn't happen right away, but it's the beginning of the opening. Up until that time, they were an agricultural country. They were almost from the Middle Ages still, right? They could have been sort of, you know, 1600s kind of society, right? So in a matter from 1854 to 1904, they industrialized themselves. They build a navy, they build an army, largely trained by the US, by the way, okay? Wow. Navy patterned after the British, many of their ships built by the British, all right? And they become a power in 1904. What happens in 1904? The Russians, right? They get into a fight with the Russians over parts of China and Korea and Manchuria, right? And the Russians are considered, this is the Bolshevik, not the Bolshevik, this is the Tsarist Russia, still uh, led by Alexander II. Uh, and the Russians, I wish I had a big map up here, send a fleet, a huge fleet, from St. Petersburg all the way around the world, takes them a year to get to Japan. Right at the base of where Korea point, uh, juts out as a as a peninsula. I, my daughter taught in Korea for a while, so I stood right on that beach right there. And, and you could see off into the distance on a clear day, this island called Tsushima. And they, they fight, uh, the Japanese Navy and the, Brit and the Russian Navy fight the Battle of Tsushima. And the, Ru and the Japanese annihilate them, right? First of all, they had lost a lot of ships <laughs> coming all the way around the world. They were dead tired. They were poorly led, and the, and the Japanese Navy was uh, incredibly well led, modeled itself after the British Navy, which if you're going to model yourself after a Navy, the British do a pretty good job of it, especially back then. And to their great supply, surprise, they annihilate the Russians. There's also a land map that, that goes on for a year or so here in this corner of the Korean Peninsula where it butts up to China. Uh, to China. Right, and up here is Manchuria. So, Theodore Roosevelt negotiates the peace, wins the Nobel Prize for negotiating the peace between the two of them. The uh, uh, peace treaty was signed, I think, is that the one that's trying to, uh, signed in Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, I believe. Okay, and uh, the, the Russians retreat back into their problems. Japanese become 
dominant, one of the dominant powers in, in Asia, okay? Anybody know the uh, Japanese, uh, famous Japanese naval, naval admiral, admiral named Yamamoto? Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yamamoto is 1920 years old, fights here as a, as a newly minted Navy lieutenant in the Battle of Tsushima with a famous Japanese admiral who I can't remember the name right now. Loses, I think, a couple of fingers or parts of a couple of fingers on his hand in that battle. All right? He was an aide to this. Uh, Japanese ad, right? And Yamamoto goes on to become a dominant name in, in uh, World War II for the Japanese, right? So there's connections there. So World War I comes along, and, and as I said before, from 14 to 18, the Japanese are actually on the Allied side, right? <coughs> Help out a great deal in what were limited naval engagements in the Pacific, but in enabled by having the Japanese Navy on our side in the Pacific, where the Germans had certain colonies and so forth, it enabled the British Navy and the American Navy uh, to focus on the Atlantic. So we were happy to have the Japanese, mm -hmm. right? So at the end of World War II, the Japanese are feeling pretty good, or World War I, I'm sorry, they're feeling pretty good about things. They're feeling powerful, they're part of the club. What's the club? The British Empire, the American Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire, right? Except they got a problem, big problem back then. China. China. No resources. China? China. No resources? No. Several problems. They got a bigger problem. This will sound rather odd to our modern ears. They're yellow. They're not white. They're yellow. How can you have a yellow? country become one of the strongest countries in the world, right? I mean, this was a serious, serious problem, especially for the British and the Russians, okay? To the, to the point where, I'll use the middle line here, in 19, mm, I gotta look at my notes to get the year right. Too many dates. I believe it was in 1933. the Japanese get up and walk out of the League of Nations. Everybody remember what the League of Nations was? Is what, what Wilson wanted to set up at the end of World War I. We chose not to participate, okay? But the League of Nations went on. And they get up and walk out because they feel they're being uh, uh, held, viewed as the yellow people. They feel that there's too many decisions being made against them. There's a famous, famous naval treaty about this time called the 553. And it had to do with the amount of naval weight and the size of the uh, ships that could be built. Five was the US, five was UK, and the Japanese were three. And they sort of said, why? <laughs> and it's why we're worried about you guys, you know, taking over too much of Asia. And the Japanese sort of feedback is, well, wait a second, How, you're, you guys have taken over most of the world, isn't there room for us in here? I'm being a little cynical, a little facetious, but more or less, that was it, all right? So between that and the chaos that occurred within Japan in, Japan in the 30s, uh, the, uh, uh, the Japanese become more and more militant uh, feel more and more threatened by the U.S. And eventually, it comes down to a famous, famous date, December 7th, where my mom was, okay? Was that the start of World War II? No. No? Where the United States it was. No. So, what was going on in the United States? Let's start with 1898. Sorry for this terrible... What happened in 1898? Spanish American, Spanish -American War. War. Right. Theodore Roosevelt up to San Juan Hill. We also take what else? The Philippines. Philippines. Right. We also take Hawaii. Right. We annex it. Right. So it's the first time that the U.S. really begins to flex its military muscle. Okay. 
that in World War I, well, another interesting date is 1909. Uh, yeah, 1909, when something called the Great White Fleet that Teddy Roosevelt had created, was basically the US Navy uh, battleships that he had all painted white, does a tour around the world to demonstrate <coughs> the power of the US Navy. Panama Canal opened in 1912, another Teddy Roosevelt project, all right? Basically, we just, you know, we got, kind of got in league with the Colombians who at that time controlled the Isthmus of Panama and basically sort of just did what we wanted to do <laughs> with our military might in order to build the Panama Canal, which was a great thing commercially, yeah. right? So the U.S. is slowly growing in its own power, right? And in 1914, the U.S. is the largest economy in the world, surpassed Britain a year or two before that. Okay. With a hundred and with a hundred million people in nineteen seventeen. A hundred million people. Of which in nineteen seventeen, when we go to war, twenty-five million were not born in the United States. Twenty-five million immigrants who were not born in the United States. All right? Literacy rate in the United States at that time was six or seven percent. Illiteracy, I'm sorry, illiteracy, six or seven percent. Right? But many of them were literate in other languages. Right? One of the big problems the U.S. had in World War I in the U.S. Army was they had 47 different languages. <laughs> Anybody ever watch The Lost Battalion on uh, TV? The story of The Lost Battalion in World War I? Highly recommend it if you see it someday. But they, they illustrate that uh, a lot. There were a lot of Italian soldiers, Italian Americans. They called it, in fact, the hyphenated army. Right? I forget the number, but a huge percentage of the army was came from, you know, all of our moms and dads and grandfathers and great grandfathers, right? Not when uh, they came before the Civil War. Yeah. So uh, Woodrow Wilson does what in 1917 when he declares war, makes his declaration of war speech to Congress? What's the famous line? So Woodrow Wilson, a son of a son of a minister, Scottish, long line of ministers. Woodrow Wilson, born in Staunton, is it Staunton, Virginia, just before the Civil War, grows up in the Reconstruction period of the Civil War, uh, becomes a professor, goes to Princeton. He, he really creates uh, the political science as a as a field of study, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> He's one of the first political scientists. But he is arguably our first evangelical Christian president in the sense that we use it today. Back then, the words meant something different, right? Deeply moral man, deeply uh, concerned about how his religion was going to impact the country, right? The reason he, he, he hesitated going into World War I was he just... He saw the, the uh, horrible deaths and the horrible uh, results of the trench warfare. He didn't want American men to go and get slaughtered alongside all of the French and British and everything else. Finally, with you know, what happened with the unrestricted war, uh, uh, submarine warfare, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and others pushing him to go to war. Uh, finally, if you're familiar with the Zimmerman uh, Telegraph, the German uh, foreign minister named Zimmerman sends a telegraph to the Mexicans saying, hey, if the U.S. comes into the war, we want you to invade uh, you know, Texas, New Mexico, and California and take back the land they took from you 50 years before. And that really is the final straw that pushes him into, into the war. But he has a famous, famous line in his speech that, that, uh, for the declaration of war, and that's that he wants to make the world safe for democracy. That was his moral underpinning for going to war. We want to make the world safe for democracy. And that has become, for now a hundred years exactly, almost, right? Actually, a little over a hundred years, the underpinning of all American foreign policy. Except for after World War I, we kind of retreat back till World War II starts and then since it. 
So we argue about that, what that means, and how to live it still today. You know, are we making the world safe for democracy in Niger in the middle of, you know, or did we make the world safe for democracy in Vietnam? Uh, anybody see that Vietnam series on WQED? I saw part of it. Yeah, fascinating, really fascinating and sad. Very, very sad. After that, I read H.R. McMaster's book called Their Election of Duty, which is his, H.R. McMaster's is the national security chief today to Trump, and it's about his, uh, it was his master, or his uh, doctoral thesis at North Carolina, I believe it was, on what led up to the Vietnam War and how Johnson and McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just lied and bungled their way through the beginning of the Vietnam War. Really highly recommend that book. H.R. McMaster, brilliant guy, All right? But uh, making the world safe for democracy has been something we've been working on for a long time. Right. And whether, you know, how we do it, when we do it, where we do it, it's what we always argue about. I don't know that it'll ever be settled, okay? So I want to try to wrap this up. Um, so when did World War II start? 39. No. no. No, no, no. That was that was the European War. That was when the European War. Forty one. When in forty one? December December seventh. December seventh. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, right? Going back to I guess it does start that up here. Uh, going back to the development of the Jap Japan as a nation as a military power. Right? So that's not right. It didn't start on December seventh. What did, what did Roosevelt do on December 8th? He declared war against? Japan. 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 What was he going to do about Germany? Nothing for the time being. So what happened? Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Is that when the bombings of London started? No, the bombing of London was in 40 Later. and 41. Okay. So my contention is, this is just a little trick question, it started on December 11th. That's when Hitler returned from the Russian front and had the time to go in front of the uh, German parliament, the Bundestag, and deliver a, like a six hour speech, ranting and raving against the United States, and declared war on the United States, and then Italy followed a little bit later. So we then declared war on them, right? Up until that time, this is kind of what this book I recommended to you is all about, right? Up until that time, it was really two separate wars. It was an Asian war and a European war. Mm -hmm. right. It was only with Pearl Harbor and then Hitler turning around declaring war on us four days after Pearl Harbor that it became World War II. Yeah. Okay? So why did Hitler declare war on the United States? John? So there is something called the Tripartite Treaty that Japan, Italy, and Germany signed in uh, early 41, I believe, right? Which most people believe was the reason Hitler had to declare war. Not the case. Not the case. It was not written that way. Two different fronts. Pardon? You have to have the truth split between two different fronts, the United States. Part of it, yeah, part of it. So Hitler, one, didn't understand the United States. Didn't, you know, he thought, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, playing jazz music, and uh, they let all those black people uh, do things that, you know, we wouldn't even have them in Germany. You know, we're tossing out the Jews, they ought to toss out the blacks. Um, you know, uh, and more than anything else, he thought Japan, which had never lost a war, never lost a war, going back thousands of years. He thought Japan would take care of the United States in the Pacific, and the U.S. would be tied up in the Pacific for a long, long time and not be able to have an impact on uh, the European war. But he was wrong. Why was he wrong? The second half of this lecture I've done before, which I'm not going to do tonight, right? is you know, the US then, with Britain, turns around and comes up with the strategy of Germany first. 
and Japan second. And why would that be? Because Japan had attacked us, not Germany. Well, Churchill wanted it. Churchill wanted it. That's one they had, reason. They were getting the atomic bomb. Who was? Germany. Germany. Yeah, there was concern about that. Not at that time so much, but there was a little bit of concern about that. So the, the George Marshall, who was the uh, uh, chief of staff of the U.S. Army, eventually the first real, first really ran the war, okay, um, and other military experts convinced uh, FDR, and he didn't need much convincing, he thought this already, prompted by Churchill, that you had to defeat Germany first because its economic power was 10 times what Japan was, okay? Japan produced very little steel. Japan didn't have any oil. Japan didn't have the natural resources. Germany was the third strongest uh, you know, economy in the world at that time. And, and certainly had the strongest army by far. I, we already, though, were working on uh, breaking the Japanese code by that time, too, weren't we? When Pearl Harbor started. We were working on it. We didn't have it, the Japanese yeah. naval right. code. Actually, right. there, there's a little bit of confusion. So we had broken the Japanese diplomatic code. There's the famous uh, 14 cables that came into uh, the uh, Japanese embassy leading up to uh, right. uh, Pearl Harbor. Right. And, and the 14th we, we is were broken. We were able to read them all. Yeah. So we were able to read them. But, but then subsequently, leading up to the Battle of Midway in June of 1940, mm -hmm. we broke parts of the Japanese naval code, okay, yeah. which was much more important. Mm -hmm. okay. And then, of course, on the European side, uh, the, mostly the British and the Polish uh, f uh, uh, people before Poland was run over uh, had worked on breaking the German enigma, enigma code. And by, if you ever see that famous movie, uh, not famous, but uh, there's another movie about the breaking of the enigma code. I forgot what it's called. Anyway. It's recent, last four or five years. Yeah. And it tells a decent story, yeah. The imitation game? Yeah, that's right, the imitation game, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, you know, like any movie, it over-dramatizes parts and it, you know, combines people and so forth, but it's a reasonable proximity of what happened. So yeah, we did a great job in, on intelligence, the allies in general. Mm -hmm. we, we had a, a woman from uh, Crafton High School who uh, worked with the group in Washington, D.C. In, in the Naval Department of breaking that code. She was a code breaker. Oh, wow. So, yeah. um, and she was given poison pills to take in mm. case the Japanese or the Germans ever captured Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. And though she didn't tell anybody in the family that until she was on her deathbed. Oh, wow. And then she called them over to her deathbed, yeah. and, or she said, um, before you all leave, she said, I want to show you something that I never told you about. She said, over in that top drawer, there's a little box. Bring it over here. And they brought it to her, and she took the lid off, and she said, these were my poison pills that we were told to take in case the Japanese or the Germans ever captured us. Wow. Well, luckily she never did. <laughs> so that's it, really. I mean, the point I like to make is that if you look at history, it has a long tail on it. You know, World War II didn't just come out of nowhere. You know, in Asia, you know, it goes back to the mid 19th century, and in Europe, it goes back at least until 1870 or so. So, World War II really was the combination of two wars at the same time. And the Japanese and the Germans never really coordinated their war efforts, okay? Despite all that stuff you see on the military history channel and all that, most of it is garbage. Right? It's, it's just, this is what, this is the reality of it, okay? You got to get down into the, to the weeds, okay? Uh, so the Japanese and the Germans never really coordinated uh, their military strategy. Mm -hmm. If they had, if they had done it correctly, the Japanese, instead of going south and invading the Philippines and, and uh, Pearl Harbor, would have gone north and invaded Siberia from behind, right? And Russia would have collapsed in weeks because they couldn't fight, you know, on both fronts. So, okay, any other questions that I can try to answer? Were Japanese troops still in China at that point? At what point, at the end of the war? No, at the beginning, like in, in uh, 
they, so, were in, they were in China in the 30s. Right? Yeah, yeah, so what 30s. I didn't go into on the Japanese side was that Japan, after the Russo-Japanese War, started colonies in Manchuria in the teens and 20s. And then in 1931, they actually take over a big part of Manchuria. And what grows up there is something called the Kwantung Army, which becomes almost a life to itself. And a man named Tojo, at one point, was in charge of it, as were many others, right? And they decide that they're going to force a war. And so eventually, in 1937, they, they have taken all of Manchuria by then. They invade China proper, the famous incident at Marco Polo Bridge just outside of uh, Beijing, right? And then starts the Japanese, the Sino-Japanese uh, War, right? which goes on for four years. It's really a big part of the lead up to their deciding to uh, uh, in, invade the Philippines and Indochina mm -hmm. and try to take out the Navy, uh, US Navy at Pearl Harbor, right? The, the connection between these two wars is this, that as the European war raged on and Germany took over France, Holland, Belgium, etc. All their colonies in, um, in Southeast Asia, particularly the French in Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, etc., uh, the uh, Dutch in uh, the Dutch East Indies, etc., etc., are sort of set adrift. And so the Japanese saw that as easy pickings, mm -hmm. since the motherland had, had been taken over by Germany. Mm -hmm. right? That's one reason they decided to go south rather than north, because they wanted the resources from those colonies of the European countries. So at what point <clears throat> were there not a lot of Japanese troops still in China? In well, America? never. So, so the Japanese army was mm, two and a half, three million people, men, and 75% uh, of them were in China. It's a huge country, <laughs> yeah. right? And they took over much of the coastal lands. They took over Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, went deep into some parts of China, but still only controlled maybe a tenth or so of it, maybe 10, 15%. And they did a huge army on the ground there to try to uh, uh, maintain what they had, much less win it, right? So uh, it was a big help to us because as the US, uh, the Marines and the Army and the Navy came across the Pacific, the Japanese kept their million plus man army in China. Right. right? And we did not, we never invaded mainland China, thank God, mm -hmm. because I think we'd have been bogged down, right? <clears throat> All the um, <clears throat> battles in the Pacific were relatively small battles because there were islands where you could only get twenty or 30,000 men on it no matter what anyway, except for the Philippines. That got to be a larger battle. How, how did the Japanese fleet, you know, get ready in China, move across the ocean and attack Pearl Harbor without the United States knowing, knowing that that was going to happen? Yeah. How could you move a whole fleet, I mean a big, big fleet, and then the United States be going to church on Sunday, and they, oh my God, we're being attacked, and everybody's at church. Yeah. They did it. Yeah. Yeah. They did it, they well, did it. They did it. So you can ask that same question about 9-11. How did they we did not know they, they were coming? You can ask that same question lethal. about the Battle of the Bulge. How did we not but know Hitler was yeah. going to attack with this huge army? And it was the la you know, incredible intelligence failures on our part, mm -hmm. and it was an audacious military move for them to take their whole fleet across. The, they, a book, at Dawn We Slept, is the classic book, it has Pittsburgh connections with a, mm -hmm. a Pitt history professor who I don't think teaches there anymore, lives in St. Clair, named Goldstein. He was one of the researchers on that book with the author, who I can't remember. And uh, at Dawn We Slept would answer all those questions. It's about twice as big as that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, they, 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 they planned this meticulously. Yamamoto, who was at the 1904 Battle of Tsushima, uh, uh, was the strategist behind it all. They went, they marshaled all their uh, ships in the north of Japan. They came across the northern Pacific and then down. There was, you know, very little radar at that time. And, you know, we, we knew the, the fleet was missing. We didn't know where they were going. You could see that they were marshaling for an attack to the south. Into, into China and possibly the Philippines. And that's where most of the US military thought they were going to go. But it is 
the most historic lapse of intelligence in U.S. military history. And they said that the, the reason Hitler lost everything was he messed with Russia, with Barbarossa. Yeah, I he guess. He should have never attacked Russia, they said. He well, wouldn't have attacked Russia. I mean, he lost that whole army, the Sixth Army, 600,000 men. That's Stalingrad. I read something that only 40,000 came back from the prison yeah. camps. Yeah. Yeah. If he that, starved them all. Yeah. Yeah, the, the issue was eventually those two guys were going to clash, Stalin and Hitler. But they said and so Hitler just felt, left them alone. No, I don't think so, because Stalin wasn't going to let Hit, leave Hitler alone. Yeah, right. Eventually, he'd have, they'd have had a war. And a question of on whose terms it was going to be fought. Yes, sir. Supposedly, Japan did send messages to somebody that they were going to attack Pearl Harbor. Messages were delayed in process somehow through the White House, and it was basically given up as a threat. Yeah. They said they, they weren't crazy enough to do it. There were all and sorts of was, yeah. just bypassed. All sorts of missteps like that. I don't know about that particular one. Stalin was warned for months and months by very credible sources that the Germans were going to invade Russia in June of '41 and he disregarded all of them because he didn't believe that was possible and you know, he you know, suffered the consequences. Well, it's just like Napoleon. Germany <coughs> went like Napoleon, the Russian winner, killed them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think it's gotten late. Um, I'll stop there. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.